Things going straight away because on a bit of a tight deadline this morning um, with this event taking place from 10.30 through to 11.20. And I'll say now we do need to be out relatively quickly at 11.20 because they've got another event starting from 11.30 or so. So I'll, I'll be ushering people out uh, when, when the time is due. But thank you all so much for coming along this morning um, for this event on fixing city regulation to enable growth. Um, my name's Nick King. I'm a research fellow at the Centre for Policy Studies, um, an organisation I've been working with since I left government in 2018. I'm a former special advisor, was chief of staff to Sajid Javid in various different roles. Um, and we're here today to talk about growth. And I think growth is very much sort of vogue term. Whatever we think about Liz Truss's premiership, she did remind us all that growth has been anemic in this country for some time and needs uh, needs considering and trying to fix and now we have the leadership of both the main political parties talking about growth a lot we have Rishi Sunak making it one of his five priorities we have Jeremy Hunt um, producing an autumn statement for growth uh, we have Rachel Reeves securing growth one smoked salmon breakfast at a time and we have Keir Starmer channeling his inner Margaret Thatcher and talking about how we can uh, secure growth at the Centre for Policy Studies we've been fixated on growth for some time, as have Cordiant Capital, who are very kindly sponsoring this event this morning. Cordiant um, are an infrastructure and real assets manager and have been focusing on um, high growth businesses and investment in infrastructure. Um, we're delighted to have their sponsorship for this um, and I will introduce each of our panellists um, to come up one by one. But we'll start with Ben, um, who is co-chief exec at Cordiant. Um, ben was, has over 30 years of experience in digital and related areas as an equities analyst, investment banker, board member and investor, and was a top-ranked analyst in technology and telecoms technology while working at RBC Capital Markets. But he's moved on to even greater things at Cordian Capital. So, Ben, over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Um, we have 50 minutes to solve the problems of city regulation, so that's, that's an easy task that should be sorted quickly. And don't drink too much of the coffee they need it for the next event. But um, <laughs> anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I would uh, like to express thanks to my fellow panelists, Baroness Altman, who's proof that thoughtful parliamentarians can truly uh, make a difference with her, her recent private members bill standing as, as an excellent exemplar of that. Uh, in uh, Bim Afalami, we have a city minister who's surely coined uh, a saying with great staying power, the safest graveyard. I think hopefully, hopefully that is going to stick around until the graveyard is shunted aside. And uh, uh, David Ferris obviously brings great um, expertise in pension regulation uh, with his long, ten uh, long tenure at the uh, pensions regulator. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here today. Um, why is Cordiant interested in this? We're a relatively uh, small firm. Uh, we're only $4 billion. We're not uh, a BlackRock. We have uh, one investment trust listed on the London Stock Exchange in which we raised about £800 million. Pounds. It was the first uh, investment trust that specialized in investing in digital infrastructure. Uh, but we are uh, uh, maybe a, a little bit contracyclical, actually, um, investing more in the UK. We have uh, made London our largest office now, uh, effectively moving the center of, of gravity here from uh, Canada. And we have a keen interest in seeing the ecosystem build. So this is not meant to be a controversial contribution uh, from, from Cordian, more so a, a marker that I think collectively we all need to work and think practically about how to transition the desire for growth and for more investment from pensions into the actual reality of how to make that happen. Uh, the UK, I mean, just to contextualize this, the UK ranks about 19th of, of 20 in investment, of, uh, 19th of 20 high-income countries in terms of investment as a, a percentage of GDP. Um, yet it has a two and a half trillion pound pensions uh, pot, collective defined uh, benefit and defined contribution. And many other countries have shown that those funds can flow in a way that is uh, appropriate to those countries and to bring great benefit. And I'm not suggesting that the UK should copy Canada, for example, which has a, a completely different model, some of which may not actually work all that well here. Um, but what the UK can do is, is maybe think about two things. And the first, I'd say that you have already uh, begun to address with your safest graveyard comments, which is to attack 
an attack is probably the wrong word to politely challenge this notion of security first in pensions. Capitalism is not without risk. You obviously need boundaries, you need rules, you need proper regulation, but you don't need to make a cult of it. You also need to understand that if you wish reward, you do occasionally need to take some risk and through diversification and other things, you can manage those. Um, secondly, uh, there are a set of tweaks, practical tweaks, that can, um, that can cut through what I uh, could easily term a, a kind of mutually reinforcing complexity doom loop of regulation. And Bar Baroness Altman has actually been at the forefront of this on uh, trust fee double counting, where, uh, uh, you know, an alphabet soup of things such as uh, MIFID and AIFM, AIFMD have come together to, uh, to cause an absolute pain for uh, for a, a critical sector of British capital markets. So if you're going to talk about this, I, I could bore you for far longer than 50 minutes or even 350 minutes on the topic, but I'll take one tangible example, and it's close to our heart because we actually have an investment trust, and that is if you're looking at taking defined contribution pension money and investing it in growth equity or in, uh, in uh, infrastructure, or even in venture capital. There have been a lot of discussions, and, and it's not that the regulators haven't listened. In fact, they've come up with a solution, but it's the classic um, horse designed by a committee solution. They've come up with something called an LTAF, which I won't bore you with, uh, save to say it's ferociously complicated. And yet, sitting right there in plain sight are the investment trusts, 150 years old, they funded Marconi's first cable across the Atlantic. Uh, they exist. With a few rule tweaks, you could create a vehicle for defined contribution pension money to flow into, um, into the economy. And the rules and regulations are in a myriad of places. And what this means is a little bit of boring work to try and connect these problems and make people aware of their mutually reinforcing nature. Uh, you have the fee problem, where investment trusts are penalized, looking far more um, expensive than they are. Uh, they're categorized as high-risk funds, when investment trusts have boards of independent boards of directors to oversee costs and governance on behalf of investors. You have uh, archaic London Stock Exchange rules about portfolio concentration that hinder the ability of private equity and infrastructure firms early in their trajectories to, uh, to grow uh, because they tend to have concentrated uh, portfolios at the beginning. Um, and there are new rules coming out that will handicap the investment banks and brokers in this country and in a few years they will have to start carrying a lot more capital to market make and to trade in investment trusts uh, because they're categorized as high risk funds despite having this uh, world-beating governance and independent board of directors and daily liquidity. So um, I will uh, cease boring you. The worst thing is a finance person talking about what they do. I, can, I, I think you'll all need a second coffee if I keep going, but I will just end with a plea that there's a need for uh, practical action, uh, for joined up thinking about tackling some of these regulatory uh, issues. Uh, a real partnership between uh, industry and government and regulators, and I, I think it would be nice if everybody realized they were playing on, on the same team uh, to try and get the, the economy growing. So I'll end my uh, comments there and pass over to my far more interesting fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. The good news is you are in front of a room of other financial people, so I'm sure they didn't find that boring at all. Indeed, they'll, they'll have relished it. Um, next up, beaming in from afar, uh, Baroness Altman, um, who's an economist by training, but was an institutional asset manager, heading up pension investing for Chase and Rothschilds in London before starting her own consultancy, um, but was, of course, also a former UK pensions minister and is a member of the House of Lords. So thank you so much for joining us, Baroness Altman. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, but it's great to be here. Uh, and also, I thank CPS and Cordiant for putting this uh, excellent event on. It's such an important and timely meeting. 
because I think we have such an amazing opportunity right now to harness pension fund assets to benefit the economy, to benefit pensioners, and to benefit future growth as well. Uh, it has struck me as so strange in the last few years that pensions have become a kind of no risk, low risk uh, zone. When actually, if you look at the history of pensions and especially our defined benefit schemes, they, I believe, were in quite a significant measure responsible for the success of British equity markets and the financial sector as a whole, because we had an extremely strong domestic institutional investor base willing to take long term views, willing to recognise that if capitalism is to mean anything, it should mean that if you take risk in a measured way and in a diversified manner, you should be rewarded over the long term with better returns than if you decide you're just going to use bonds. When I started in pensions, we, we were um, the only country in Europe, pretty much, there was a little bit in the Netherlands, who weren't funding our pensions via the bond markets. And we took the step um, of putting our money into equities, which meant that our pension funds grew better we had tremendous incentives from government to do so. And it was a virtuous circle whereby long-term pension assets boosted long-term growth in the home market. Uh, and it worked very well. Unfortunately, uh, there has been a trend away from equities to the extent that now most of the big defined benefit pension schemes have 2 3 4% in, in UK equities at most. That's it. Now, that explains to me why we have had such weakness in our um, domestic financial markets. Clearly, QE has a role to play because as uh, the Bank of England and other central banks were artificially depressing bond yields, that became difficult for people managing pension funds and, and the liabilities kept uh, growing in, in a way that, that became very serious for balance sheets of corporate sponsors. But we've finished that period now, and I think we have an opportunity to recognise that if we believe that we are in a capitalist system, which I certainly do, and I, I would imagine people in the room do, now is the time for government to help UK investors, particularly pension investors, recognise the benefits and the rewards and opportunities of investing in local growth, in national growth, which is so badly needed, whether that's via infrastructure or small growth businesses um, or other areas which have been crying out for uh, extra investment. I think the fact that the government is putting £70 billion a year now, which is the amount of tax relief and national insurance relief going into pensions at least every year. Uh, and most of that money is supporting other economies makes no sense to me anymore. I think it's time for the government to uh, recognise that pension assets need to be directed uh, and incentivised more to support UK growth. And, and as Cordian have said, one of the ideal ways for you to use both defined benefit and defined contribution pension assets, by the way, not just defined contribution, is to look at the homegrown expertise that is already there in our investment companies, whether it's uh, investment trusts specialising in alternative energy infrastructure or small growth companies. We have plenty of them at big discounts right now. Um, and, and also, of course, we, we have an, an opportunity to buy those at discounts so that we can, again, create a virtuous circle where pension schemes buy assets that need investment. They should ultimately become re-rated. The UK economy should benefit. And pension trustees, as well as individual pension investors, 
would also be able to understand from that that they will be creating a better economy in which their members can retire into, which will give their members, uh, you know, when they become pensioners, more income and a better standard of living in a country which is thriving rather than a country which is being starved of domestic investment, which is the way I see it right now. I hope that we can overcome regulations that have been hampering this, whether it's from pension regulators who have indulged in what I call reckless conservatism, which is taking away the opportunity of higher investment returns over the long run from both DB and DC schemes. Um, and whether it's also the regulations that my private members bill is meant to address, which have made UK investment companies <coughs> uniquely seem uncompetitive and expensive relative to the rest of the world and indeed relative to some of the other companies in the UK that are choosing to ignore the regulations that currently exist. And I know that our excellent minister, Bim Afalami, who I'm very much looking forward to hearing, is on the case. Uh, and, you know, I, I completely agree with him on this idea of pensions having been hobbled by regulations to, to make them this kind of safe graveyard whereby they have missed out on investment opportunities. They were caught up in last year's sudden spike in interest rates, lost five, six hundred billion pounds of asset value as a result. You know, the, the fact that, that DB schemes match liabilities in the long run via an estimate of future guilt yields doesn't, in my view, make up for the fact that asset values in real terms now have plummeted by hundreds of billions of pounds. And, and I agree also that, that the LTAFs, which the government wants to set up, are only one way for defined contribution pension schemes to invest in infrastructure more and support British growth more. Using um, closed-ended investment companies is an ideal way of tapping into that expertise and building a diversified portfolio where, it, you know, individuals don't have that expertise and nor do most uh, pension funds themselves. So we have an opportunity. I hope that this morning will help us unpack some of the reasons why pension money could and should be far more directed to reviving the economy and reviving our financial markets. Uh, and I look forward to hearing what our other panelists uh, are thinking and then to the discussion afterwards. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Bernard, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with, with impeccable timing, uh, Baroness Oldman has talked about the, the reckless conservatism of the, the pensions <laughs> regulator. Uh, David Fares is no longer with the pensions regulator. He's now a, a partner at Lane, Clark and Peacock um, and former pensions partner at KPMG, um, as well as being former executive director of regulation analysis at the pensions Should regulator. So, David, over to you. Thank you. Um, oh, you know, an embarrassment of choice. <laughs> So uh, from April this year, I joined LCP as a partner, but before that, for a period of almost five years, I was executive director of regulatory policy analysis and advice, the longest job title in the regulator, uh, for a period of almost five years. So I was, I was probably one of those that the minister refers to as being uh, a guardian of the, of the safest graveyard. Um, is, is that fair? Well, well, I'll obviously try and say... Uh, Probably, probably not in, in the case of the pensions regulator, uh, although I do find myself now in my role at LCP sort of justifying some of the things that I did uh, when I was at the regulator. I must make it clear I'm not speaking on behalf uh, of the regulator. I stopped doing that in, in March. Um, but if you look at the landscape uh, for DB and DC pensions, I think, I think that's quite an important thing to get clear in your mind. Uh, if you go back to 2012, there were 3,700 single employer defined contribution schemes. As of today, there are 1,200. And alongside the autumn statement, there was an analysis of how the DC market will develop. And it's predicted that actually the market will fall to around 
uh, 500 single employer DC. So there's actually a huge amount of consolidation that's happening within the DC market. Some of that is, is quite deliberately driven by regulation and oversight, uh, because time and time again we found at the regulator that small DC schemes not terribly well governed, the investment choices not always good and the charges can be high. So there are good regulatory reasons why you might want uh, to drive consolidation. Government might also want to drive consolidation because actually if you build DC funds at scale, then they have the governance budget to be able to invest in the sort of things uh, the government would want to. But consolidation, because it is happening at a fairly rapid pace and it's happening with some of those smaller DC schemes, I would challenge whether it's actually worth the government's effort to try and accelerate consolidation at a faster rate than is already naturally taking place. And partly I say that because there is a sort of uh, just the boring bits of, of absorption of consolidation. But actually if you consolidate a lot of those small DC schemes, you don't end up with a huge uh, heap of beans to invest in the sort of things that the government would want to. Um, the analysis with the autumn statement said uh, by around 2030, 95% of people will be saving into five DC master trusts. In total, they'll have assets of getting on for 400 billion. So they will have the scale and be able to invest in the sort of things that the government wants to. Indeed, if you look at what Nest does at the moment, it's got for getting on for 30% of its assets, investing in exactly the, the sort of productive finance assets that the government would want. So, so further consolidation in DC, I think, has got limited upside in terms of, con of getting the size of funds that will invest. I think there is still merit in trying to take away some of the barriers and uh, Ros talked about some of those, uh, just to drive that kind of incremental increase in, in uh, productive finance. But you're not going to get the huge uplift in investment that you want. DB, I think, is a different matter. Uh, there are kind of two uh, proposals that the government is looking to implement or consult on. The first of those is potentially to make the Pension Protection Fund a consolidator. If you consolidate the smallest 2,000 DB schemes, mm -hmm. you get something like 20 billion in terms of assets. So you still don't get a huge amount. By contrast, the 80 largest DB schemes cover something like three quarters of that one and a half trillion of universe. So uh, yes, uh, consolidating 2,000 smallest DB schemes is good for a governance point of view, it's good for producing economies of scale, but it's not going to produce at scale, the sort of investment that the government would probably like to see going into productive finance. LCP came up with a concept, and this might sound slightly contradictory, so let me, let me explain it. And it was probably true that when I was at the regulator, where you know, the, the job of the regulator is to ensure that people get mm. their, their pension benefit, their promised benefit, with a high degree of probability. And that probably means that you're putting more money aside than you might need on a best estimate basis because you've got to deal with the sort of downside scenarios that became very evident in Carillion and, and so on. So uh, there, there is that natural tendency, if you like, to require more assets than you would want on a best estimate basis. Now the challenge if you're a sponsoring employer is it's very easy to put money into a DB scheme it's almost impossible to get it out. So actually there's very little upside for employers to invest in the sort of assets that might produce higher levels of growth because they can't then access that growth by extracting it from the pension scheme. If it goes badly wrong, then they have to put more money in. So it's a kind of asymmetric risk that the employer is running. Very easy to put money in, very difficult to get it out. So LCP put forward the idea, which is uh, one of the ideas consulted on in the autumn statement, is you make it easier, this sounds counterproductive, easier for employers to take surplus out. So there is a rationale for employers to want to drive higher levels of growth, higher investment returns. Now the challenge if you're a government is, well actually if you allow surplus to come out of the pension scheme and something goes wrong, members don't get their full benefit, 
that's not going to look very well. So the second tranche of the LCP idea is that you change the PPF rules, so for an additional premium, members get full protection. So under every circumstance, members will always get their promised benefit, even if the employer has taken some of the surplus out. So if you allow employers to benefit from the upside, you provide protection, downside protection for the members so they always get their benefit, then you free up the pension scheme to invest in higher levels of growth assets, which is kind of what, what my fellow panellists are wanting. But I sort of think you have to do those three things together in order to create the right environment to do that. And if you look at uh, some of the large DB pension schemes, lights of USS, railways, they invest 30% or more of their assets in the sort of vehicles uh, in productive finance that the government would want. The problem is if you're on a treadmill where you've closed your DB scheme and you're on your way to an insurance company, when you try and pass the liabilities to the insurance company, the insurance company will say, we don't want the assets, the productive finance assets that you've invested in. And slightly logically, pension schemes have to sell them before they do an insurance buyout. The insurance company then buys almost the same assets back again, but in a way which is, which is counted as uh, attractive for solvency too. Uh, and so you've got this in enormous loss of value where pension schemes are forced sellers when they want to go to buyout, but actually the insurance companies buy back those same assets restructured slightly differently. David, so a scheme that is, I'll, I'll finish with this one. Thank you. A scheme that is five to seven years away from buyout will be advised not to buy in the sort of things that the government wants them to because the insurance companies don't want them. Uh, thank you, David. So lots to respond to there, Bim. We've, we've talked a little bit about risk, reward and culture. We've talked about extracting surplus and some of the strange rules around, around buyouts. We've also talked a little bit about tweaks that could be made to get more money into investment trusts. But I know the ambition sort of goes way beyond that. Um, Bim Aflami has been an MP for the last six years uh, at Hitchin and Harpenden representative. Before that was in the city, um, worked as a corporate lawyer at Freshfields and also in restructuring and strategy at HSBC. Uh, newly appointed to his role, um, but it's obviously one of the most exciting positions in government at the moment. Huge amount going on and no doubt you're going to put your own uh, flavour into that as well. So thank you for joining us, Bim. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. So look, um, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, for being here, and it's it's fascinating um, subject. I think that the first thing I'll say is that I am so honoured to have what is the best job outside the cabinet. In fact, this is a better job than quite a lot inside the cabinet as well. Um, so I'm I'm very um, I'm deeply honoured to have this role, particularly after my career before coming into Parliament. So underpinning. So so I think that what I want to do is we've been in we've been in the weeds a little bit about regulation, pensions, various things. I want to take us out for a sec, and I want to think about one word, and I want you to think about this at the beginning, which is risk, okay? And I want you to think about risk, and I'm going to do something that I haven't always done, which is to be uh, nice to our dear regulators. And you may be thinking, where's he going with this? Let me explain. Now, in this very room, eight, nine months ago, I set up something called the Regulatory Reform Group. And what we were doing, working with senior parl parliamentary colleagues, people like Robert Buckland, Andrew Tyree, uh, Alan Cairns, uh, Vicky Ford, various others. And what we were trying to do was to look at our entire regulatory system, not one rule or that rule or another one, look at the system and think, how can we better design a regulatory system so that we can have higher growth and a more effective market for all of our businesses. Because about half of the British economy operates in a regulated sector, right? In terms of the private sector bit of our economy. Obviously, the public sector is about 40% or whatever. But in terms of the private bit, about half of it is regulated. OK. Risk. Our society, and dare I say it, it's not just a problem in the UK, but I think it's a problem across many countries in the Western world. We have over the last generation sought to eliminate risk in almost every conceivable way that we can. We see it in terms of 
speed limits and tolerance for that. We see it in terms of how people look after their children and the amount of time they allow them to go out without being seen. We see it in terms of people's attitudes, people playing dangerous sports, all sorts of other things. But of course, we also see it in the regulated part of our economy. And so our regulators and our political system, and it's important that we're honest about that, it's not just regulators, OK? It's, it's, it's a broader ecosystem problem. We have sought to eliminate all risks. Now, of course, risk is a bit like energy. It can't be destroyed. What it does, it gets transferred and it gets to put in different areas. And what has happened over time is that when we have sought to eliminate all risk, what happens is you limit opportunities for innovation and growth. Because these things are directly intrinsically linked. And it's not that we did one particular rule or one piece of legislation over the last generation where this has happened. It's happened cumulatively over time. Thousands of actions from different unconnected people have created this. And so we now find ourselves in the position where, in many senses, in some sectors, we find regulators having imposed a significant number of rules, uh, laws having been passed, where we are regulating safe graveyards. We are saying everything is safe, but there is little activity. <laughs> And I think that the reason why I started to explain this is because I think it's important we see where this came from. This is not a sort of nefarious, evil regulators wanting to shut down the British economy. That is not what's happening. This is a broader societal issue, I think, in which the regulators and our regulatory system have responded. <coughs> so what are we doing about it? Uh, and what we're doing about it, this government, is we are doing our very best to change this whole framework. Let me list what we're doing. First, is for the first time, bearing in mind we've had a regulatory state for the last best part of 35, 40 years. For the first time, we are imposing a growth and competitiveness duty on our regulators. They are now, on an annual basis at the very least, and with me imposed, they're going to have to report on this more than annually, how they are delivering on that new growth and competitiveness objective. This is really important because this is the first time where they have been, we are forcing them in law to think about how are their actions and their proposed rules or the proposed changes or whatever they're doing, how is that impacting on the growth and competitiveness of the UK? That's the first thing we're doing. We are also beefing up the role of the um, regulatory complaints commissioner. Now, this is something that many of you may not be aware of, but there has been a a complaints commissioner that, that deals with complaints from industry or members of the public about regulators, we're beefing up that role. And we're going to announce in due course who the, um, the next person is to take that up. And that role, um, I will be working with very closely to make sure that any complaints that any businesses have or members of the public, they're taken up and dealt with properly at the highest level. And I will continue in my time, you know, there's a year left of this parliament, you know, I'll continue to look at other ways in which we can change the incentive structure around our regulatory system so that we tilt the balance back towards innovation, growth, and dynamism. But we've heard already today a lot about pensions. And I think that what I want to say before I talk to you a little bit about pensions is why on earth pensions matters. Because a lot of you are sitting there thinking, why, why on earth are they talking about pensions? You know, why does pensions matter so much? The reason why pensions matters is because <clears throat> the pools of capital that are invested through pensions are significant untapped resources for the productive economy in this country. As we've already heard, we rank lowly so far, uh, lowly in, in the developed world, for investment. What does that mean? It means that if you're running a company or want to set up a company in this country, and you want to attract people to invest in your business, there are, there's just less of that capital to go around than in other jurisdictions. That's a problem, because it means that when you get to a certain, even if you, to be fair, we've got a very vibrant startup culture, but the difficulty is when you're starting up, you don't need that much capital. You need a little bit. But once you get to a certain size, that's when you need a large amount of capital. And if those pools of capital in the UK either aren't there or aren't incentivized to invest in your sort of business, where do you go? the United States or somewhere else. So we've seen so many of our successful British businesses with British founders employing British people, when they get to a certain size, and they say this sort of scale up, when they get to a certain size, they go somewhere else. 
And then the, this country loses their growth, we lose their dynamism, we lose those people, and then we lose that ecosystem, right? So what we're trying, the reason why pensions matters is it's to help fill that gap, <clears throat> yeah? It's to get significant amounts of capital that is sitting there at the moment in comparatively less productive things in terms of returns for savers. And by the way, the savers aren't getting great returns either because, of course, um, if you're investing in, in bonds or, or gilts, those returns are not as high over a long duration as equities. Yeah? So we're trying to plug that gap. Yeah, that's why that matters. And in addition to that, that investment is one of the reasons why we have regional inequality, economic inequality in this country, because there isn't enough investment going to different parts of the country that are not London and South East. Right, because that the the, paucity, the, the the comparatively smaller amount of investment we have gets over concentrated in the southeast. So, by increasing this pensions investment through the government's reforms, in particular relating to solvency two, I won't bore you with all the details of it. What I will say is, broadly, we're making regulatory changes that will free up the capital that pension funds have in order to invest. Yeah, that's what we're basically doing. Um, and indeed, local government as well. We're, by increasing the size of the pool, what we're doing is we're encouraging local government, um, local government uh, invest pension funds to, to invest in the way that we're talking about. So what you've got is you've got these uh, pools, pools of capital that are able now to not, and over the next few years will continue to be able to not just invest more in the UK as a whole, but invest in the regions of this country, which helps promote growth. Now, the third point I want to make just is about the regions. Again, when we talk about growth and, and economic issues, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody else, we think about numbers. I don't know how many billions have been talked about today. right? We talk about big numbers that, frankly, are quite difficult to get your arms around, quite difficult to understand unless you're in the financial services sector. But I think and one of my priorities in this role is to connect these big numbers and big banks and big pension funds and big capital connect it to individuals, ordinary people in this country. How are we going to do that? I think that is promoting ownership. There is no point this country doing all the right things, investing in our growth, getting the pension funds to do what we need to do, changing the regulatory structure, incentivizing innovation, if that is not reaching all the people in our country. And so promoting ownership is really critical. One thing at the autumn statement that didn't get as much pickup as I thought it would, uh, because I think it's very exciting, is we are going to do in the next 12 months and hopefully sooner, you know, the Chancellor is committed to trying to um, do a retail offer for NatWest shares that the government owns about 40%. And we're committed to doing that over the next 12 months, right? This is a great British opportunity. Um, some of you will remember a little thing called Tell Sid. <laughs> Those of you who are my age or younger won't, but it is a great opportunity, the first time in a generation, to offer ordinary people a chance to own a great British business. And I'll be looking at different ways in which we can, not just in relation to that, but in other ways in which we can encourage ownership amongst people in this country. Um, and where I will finish off is simply to say this. Um, when we think about growth, and we think about regulation. There are lots and lots of individual measures we're taking. These things called the Edinburgh reforms, they're over 25 measures that we committed to doing a year ago. We've already done more than half of them, and it's my job, as the Chancellor and Prime Minister told me, to make sure we get the rest done as soon as possible. We've got the Mansion House reforms, talk about the pensions that we've talked about. And there are all sorts of other measures that I've mentioned, the growth and competitiveness obligation on the regulators. <coughs> But underpinning all of it is a bit of a challenge for politicians and a challenge for you as voters and people in the members of the public. And, this, and that is this challenge, and I'll finish with this. Ultimately, all of this can work if we rediscover our country's appetite for innovation, growth, and risk. We need to accept as a society not to seek to eliminate risk in every single instance. Because unless we can do that, all of the hard work that's been done by so many people won't have the full achievement that it could and won't have the full benefit that it could unless culturally and attitudinally we change. And that's one of the things I hope to bring to this role. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ben. Um, we were going to have a bit of a conversation up here, but in the interest of time, I'm going to um, come to the floor pretty quickly. I just Before we do, I just wanted to ask um, ben, ben one question, mm. which is, it feels to me that um, there are different asset classes, each of whom look at, in particular, sort of pension fund parts and think, oh, there's a big opportunity here. So we've talked a little bit about infrastructure. You talked about equities. There was something in the autumn statement about how the Chancellor would like more of the local government pension scheme into private equity. Mm. There's regeneration and local growth. Uh, there's real estate. Um, now, of course, a lot of that money is currently allocated to fixed income, bonds and gilts, mm. and private capital. But there's only so much to go around, and yeah. I appreciate it's a big pot. Are we asking pension fund money to do a little bit too much? So, look, that's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, let me explain a little bit about this. So you mentioned the pension fund money and all the different assets you want them to invest in. A big part of the challenge, which we haven't really talked about today, which I will accept is a lot on government, is to make sure you actually have the viable investment things to be invested in. Right? There's no point having lots of money unless you have that. And so working with my colleague Gareth Davis in the Treasury and the Chancellor, the work we're doing on uh, investment zones, the work we're doing on um, working with infrastructure and projects authority to make sure there's a good pipeline of things, work we're doing with the British Business Bank and British Patient Capital, all of that is about creating more investable assets. Do, do you see what I mean? So it's not like there's a fixed pool of the investable assets. That pool can increase. Yeah. So that's part of the answer. And the second one is the local government pension scheme um, going to what we've got a target. I didn't mention it in my talk but I, because I'd forgotten, but now you've reminded me. We've got a target to increase the amount that the local government pension schemes that we're putting into these pools, of we've just, of these consolidated pools that I've described, to go up to 10% in private equity and alternative assets. Right? So it's that when you're dealing with 100 billion, 10% is quite a lot. And I hope over time that 10% then grows further and further. Though I want to be clear, our commitment is to 10%. Thank you, Bim. Um, since, <coughs> I've, since I've got the mic. Um, ben, um, Bim's talked about increasing the number of assets, investable assets, for organisations to invest in. When you look at the UK landscape in particular, do you see those assets, do you see those opportunities at the moment, and what can we do to increase them? I think there are plenty of opportunities, and I think more can be created. I think, too, that uh, one of the greatest challenges that's faced in terms of creating additional opportunities, as well as, in fact, addressing the quite commendable agenda that you've set out, is the fact that many of these things drive into uh, the wet cement of institutional rigidity. And so, uh, you know, sometimes in, in certain of these circumstances, uh, you can cajole and convince. Uh, sometimes you may need to push. And I sincerely hope that, uh, that this uh, initiative uh, is successful to 100% in convincing, but sometimes when you need to push, I, mm. I hope you do that as well. Fair point. I do hope we have the minister saying the wet cement of uh, institutional rigidity before long in one of his speeches. <laughs> um, well, if I say it, I promise you, it'll be my, it'll be my phrase. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you bye. never heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm going to come to the floor. If people could introduce themselves and uh, name their organisation for the question, that would be great. And questions rather than statements, please. Yeah, Bernard Casey, yeah. Pensions Sorry, economist. we've got a... Bernard Casey, pensions economist, um, former academic, former <coughs> economist. I wanted to ask the minister because he made the suggestion that at certain points people go overseas to raise the money because they can't raise it here and they go to America. Is there, however, any indication that US pension funds, US pension funds as opposed to other dimensions of the US capital markets, mm. are actually picking up this job? Or is it that there are other things in the United States which enable um, such industries uh, to, to move forward, but it's not the pensions fund problem itself? So do pension funds do it there when they don't do it here? Thank you. We're going to take three questions in a row, so I'll do one here. Thank you. And then over there, Charlie. Dominic Swan, I've just retired, um, but I used to run a $200 billion uh, investment portfolio. Um, and, and two elephants in the room we're ignoring. Uh, one is uh, tax treatment in pension funds. 
uh, that if you buy debt, that's deductible for the company and tax-free in the pension fund. But if you buy uh, equities, that's taxed at 25% uh, at the corporate level. <coughs> and the refund that the pension funds used to get via Brown uh, was abolished by his raid on pensions. And arguably that actually drives a lot of the change in asset allocation in the UK pension industry mm. over the last 30 years. So are you looking at measures to, to equalise tax treatment? And the last one, um, I raised a lot of money actually not from American pension funds, um, but from Australian and Canadian. Mm. And one of the interesting things there is a lot of it was coming out of effectively municipal employees. Uh, people who, for example, in Canada would be employed by a municipality uh, and therefore would have a funded pension scheme. But, for example, a teacher in the UK would be a central government uh, in a pension scheme and that would be an unfunded uh, in a pension scheme. So we have a lot of scope if we want to look at actually funding uh, some of our, uh, call it, quasi-state sector employees in the UK if we want to push up that total pool of capital. Thank you. And I think um, yeah, the local government pension scheme is probably about as close as we can get to yeah, that with £360 billion or whatever it is. Yeah, but Indeed. And Baudas Altman will come to you on both those two if that's okay. Yeah. Hi, Lachlan Roylander from Whitestone Insight, which is a polling firm. Um, great discussion. Thanks so much. I just had a question on ESG mm. regulations mm. and what impact... Um, have they had for uh, good or bad on the productivity and competitiveness of um, pension investments? And if bad, how can, how can we have robust ESG regs whilst also promoting um, growth and competitiveness? Fantastic. Thank you. Bim, I'll ask you to address the first. Baroness Oldman, if you could come in on Dominic's questions, and then I'm going to look at David and Ben to see if I want to take third. Bim. Um, could I... Uh can I take the ESG one first? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> the answer as to whether it's good or bad is, is difficult to discern. But what I do know, and it's something I'm working on right now, is to make sure that as soon as possible we publish the regulations around ESG ratings. Because there's a huge amount of... of um, uh, it's not very clear right now what counts as ESG for investors and the problem with that is that you'll limit the investment to everything so what we need to do is just make sure we clarify what counts as what we're working on this right now and i hope that you know in the not too distant future we'll be able to give a lot more of that clarity and i think that that will broadly increase broadly speaking increase uh increase the um the investment and then the first question was about no, remind me sir you're from the oecd what was the um, the passion around pension funds it was about where the u.s money comes from is it always oh yes funds? so it's, this is actually really interesting, I promise. So you get the US pension funds, in the, the, um, or, or North American ones. Ontario Teachers Pension Fund is a very famous one in Canada, but there are other American ones. They are very overweight in their home markets, right? So in their home markets, they invest like a disproportionate amount. Yeah? In relation to whether when you get a British business, say, that goes to America to scale up, those funds are not just pension funds, right? It's everything. It's everything from private equity to pensions to absolutely everything. And the America has the deepest markets, both private and public, in the world. But the reason why this matters in terms of people going abroad is not that those businesses won't get capital from somewhere. As I said, they will get it from somewhere. But the growth that comes as a result of that capital is, A, skewed towards the place where they've got that capital, and secondly, the returns that those successful businesses will return to their shareholders is not coming to British people and British pension funds and British savers. It's going somewhere else. So, so it's, it's partly a growth thing, but it's also returns for our people uh, issue as well. It's, it's not uncommon to see a, a U.S. pension plan, a U.S. state pension plan at 20, 25 percent or more in alternative assets in these kind of private growth assets. Thank you. And, and Ben, I'll come to Baroness Altman in a minute, but this, this sort of debt equity question is something that has sort of done the rounds in UK policy circles for, for some time. Does that affect the way you invest, and would you typically look for debt rather than equity just because of the tax treatment that Dominic's talked about? Well, our clients either give us money to invest in debt instruments or equity instruments, so that choice is, is perforce made for us. But uh, 
uh, and I'm not going to hazard any opinions on uh, on tax policy. What I what I will say is that a thriving equity sector is is history has shown. Uh, is is key to a growing economy, and my partners and I actually bought our firm from Ontario Teachers oh, right. uh, Pension Plan uh, a, a few years ago. And what they have done, exactly as you say, is they've been willing to invest in substantial um, assets in Canada, sometimes greenfield infrastructure assets in Canada, and to provide uh, precisely the growth equity that you talked about. So there is a, a bit of a virtuous circle that's been created there, and certainly the same applies in the United States and in Australia. Thank you, Ben. And Baroness Oldman, when, when you were Pensions <coughs> Minister and, and beyond, is this, is this debt equity question one that you've been thinking about? Yes, I've been thinking about this for, for many, many years. I mean, I started off managing pension fund assets and the vast majority were in those days, in the 1980s, inequities. And I, I still feel that um, we are missing one of the most important parts of the picture here, which is that taxpayers are putting £70 billion pounds and more into pension funds each year. And most of that money is not supporting UK growth. If you ask British taxpayers how they would want to spend £70 billion pounds a year, the answer would not be to buy assets overseas. Of that, I am absolutely convinced. And I think that there is a, a reason why uh, many of the actuaries and investment advisors have been steering away from the uh, UK market. Part of that is to do with the race to lower charges. And that has meant index funds and just tracking global indices, for example, if you're taking um, equity, global equity. Uh, and it's the same for other areas. Well, actually, what that has meant is that you've missed out on these extra returns. Not just that, though, the people who who are saving in a pension are likely to retire into a country which is less well off. And they, therefore, are likely to be less well off. Now that the UK markets are at such a discount to international uh, markets, I think there is a strong case anyway for government to say, if you want this £70 billion pounds a year, then a certain proportion, let's say at least 25%, should be invested in this country. Now, the ideal way, and of course that's very radical, and I'm sure that that, that isn't going to happen, but I would love to see it, um, especially as 25% of all the pensions are tax-free. But the, the ideal way to do this is via local authority pension schemes. They are not part of the PPF. They are wholly underwritten by UK taxpayers. All the returns that they earn um, go towards helping to pay the pensions. If those returns are not sufficient, UK taxpayers have to make up the balance. I think that the government is right, but it could be even more ambitious in saying to local authority pension schemes, why don't you use your assets to support local growth and national growth? growth, whether that's in infrastructure, social housing, small businesses in your um, across the country. All of those are valid ways for uh, investment money to be spent. And if taxpayers otherwise might have to spend money on boosting investment uh, in, from a different source, then if you like, you're spending the 70 billion on overseas growth and then the taxpayer still has to put more into domestic growth. There's some uh, disconnect here in terms of the of the way in which government is allocating assets. Thank you. Uh, and I do think, you know, that local authorities have a great role to play here. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice Oldman. I suppose uh, the, the flip side of that is it sounds like a lot of Canadian and Australian pension funds are, are funding our growth. So uh, we need to be a bit careful about the... Um, seeing it the other way around in, in the lens. But I take the point, and actually one of the things that struck me about the Mansion House Compact and Jeremy Hunt saying he wanted more investment into high-growth businesses, he didn't actually stipulate that they would be UK high-growth businesses, which is right. one to watch, I think. Um, we'll try and take two more questions. We're getting very close to time, but if we've got time just for two more. Yep, yeah, in the middle, and then is there anybody else? One more here, and then we'll call it there. not the FTSE 100, it's the mid and small cap, which is dwindling rapidly. 
And as a result, no companies are raising money. And that is the absolute source of growth capital for the UK economy. And uh, Jeremy Hunt in the autumn statement did mention the equity market, but I think it only got one very small comment and no, no um, backup to it. Just like to ask the Minister, is there, is there any uh, tangible signs of changes that might help the UK equity market, and particularly the medium small cap market? OK, thank you very much. And final question here. I'm Neil Scarra from Cross Consulting. Uh, we worked uh, heavily with Rachel Kent on the investment research review. Mm. And uh, coming back to some of your comments, question for the minister. How does one get a culture of competitiveness and growth to seep down through large regulatory organizations? Mm. be very fascinated to get yeah. your perspective on that. Thank you. Um, ben, perhaps I could encourage you to answer those two questions and wrap it into any concluding remarks you might have. OK. Um, how to improve the coverage of, and how to improve the capital markets for small and medium-sized companies. The work that's been done on the investment research review, which is changing the disastrous MIFID regulation, that when I, I was at HSBC at the time, and I remember people saying, this is going to damage research coverage of companies. It was done. We're now undoing it, and so I think that will make a big difference. Why? Because what it'll do is it will increase the amount of um, research that's actually done on these companies. If, you've got, if you don't have any research, nobody knows what your company does, nobody trusts necessarily what's going on. When you have more research and you encourage people to do that, then I think that will increase the coverage of those companies. But that is only one aspect. Another aspect is really all the work that's going on with the capital markets task force. And look, I'm very happy at a separate point for me to come and talk to Peel Hunt about all sorts of things that you think, because I'd like to hear from you guys about things we need to do. In relation to the point about um, how do you create the culture, and this is where I'll finish. Now, I strongly believe that ultimately people respond to the incentives that they see. And we need, the way, therefore, to change the culture, if you have a prevailing cultural mood, is not to go around necessarily making speeches, though that's important. It's to change the incentives which the key players have. That's why we change that growth and competitiveness objective, because your incentive now is you have to prove how you're doing that. But that is one step. That is the beginning. That is not the end. And I'm constantly looking for ways in which, within our legislative framework, mm. that we can change the incentives because once you have that, and I can tell you a very senior regulator explained to me that now on their submissions to the board, on the first page, there is now a statement of what does this do on the growth and competitiveness objective? He said that never, ever happened before. It's a small thing, but if we can add in lots of other things so that we change the incentives for every actor in the system, that is how you change it. But I would also say, with me having talked about regulators, this is for the political system as well. You know, it's about making sure that whenever there's a political issue, we do not just jump to the first conclusion, which is shut down the, the new thing, shut down the growth, shut down the innovation. Uh, because if you do that, then you disincentivize and you change the incentives for new people who want to maybe do that new thing. So I think that there's a responsibility on politicians and we need to structurally put things in place that make it in, worth your while to uh, promote risk, innovation and growth. Thank you, Bim. Well, it does feel like incentives are aligning, but so is the imperative around growth. And um, thank you all so much for coming for this fascinating conversation. Thank you so much to the Minister in particular for joining us. Thank you, David. Thank you, Baroness Altman. And a final thanks to Ben and Cordian Capital, without whom we thank couldn't you. have done this in the first place. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Thanks very much. Really, really, really appreciate it. You've got a card. I'll, 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 I'll,